<clears throat> Today is part two for the TrueNest uh, Advanced Digital Manufacturing webinar series. Um, today we're going to cover uh, punching and router fabrication for some sheet metal applications. So <clears throat> today uh, we'll take a look at uh, optimizing our material usage as well as integration with MRP and ERP systems, um, bringing in CAD geometry and uh, bomb information bill of materials from Inventor uh, seamlessly through our vault in, uh, integration with TrueNest. And we're going to look at some cutting techniques for um, automatic tooling for punching and routing, some use of some special tools for punching, common line uh, routing and punching. Uh, cutting, repositioning, uh, skeleton cutting, and special uh, types of tabs for both of these different processes. So I am Matt Thorne. I'm a senior manager at Majestic Technologies um, in charge of product and customer success here. So I'll be taking you through this today. Um, before I do that, I wanted to kind of give you, uh, again, some background. If you weren't with us last time, on uh, what TrueNest is. Um, at a high level. So really, TrueNest covers um, industries and, and materials um, for um, transportation, aerospace, construction, and wind energy power generation. Uh, we've been around since 1991, uh, really specializing in integration and automation of production um, in our customers' facilities. So just range of materials. Um, we work with metals, woods, composites, um, leathers, plastics, really anything that's uh, two, two and a half D materials, thick or thin, doesn't really matter. Um, we can support all these different material types as well as the different machines that um, utilize these materials. So Today we're going over some of our CNC routers and punch presses, but we also cover laser machines, water jets, plasmas, oxy fuel, um, and combination machines, so punch route, punch laser, things like that. And we do um, write all of our post processors um, for these machines as well. So just to give you an idea of kind of the workflow that we're going to go through today. TrueNest can bring in geometry from native CAD data, uh, generic CAD data like DXF, DWG, uh, IGIS, STEP files, things like that, or even legacy NC data. So if you're using things like AutoCAD or Inventor, uh, those are very well integrated within TrueNest, but we, we can also bring in outside data too if you were working with, say, SolidWorks or ProE or something like that. Uh, we can certainly support that kind of data as well. We can also um, wrap a, a PLM or PDM component around that. So in this case, we're going to be looking at Vault and how Vault stores things um, and how we can kind of get things from Vault uh, within TrueNest without uh, kind of having to search all over to find the files that we're interested in manufacturing. From there, we process all this information and we send it to the shop to be able to run uh, different machine tools, whether it's lasers, punch plasmas, water jets. And all the time we take this information from sales orders as well as material inventory. We generate reports from all the nesting and things like that um, from this process as well. And at a higher level, we start to integrate ERP and MRP to drive information from these sales orders, from inventory, track things throughout the shop, track remnants, track material usage, all these different things uh, to give you, the user, information about your entire process. So I'm going to switch it over and jump into the software. So give me one second. While you're doing that, Matt, I uh, just uh, posted something for questions. If anybody has questions, please put them in the questions tab there on your um, in your session, and we'll try to answer it at the end of the the uh, webinar. Perfect. So here I've got TrueNest up. 
And the first thing that we see when we, lock, when we open Trinest is an authentication screen. Uh, the authentication screen is necessary for us to log in with the username and password. I'm going to log in as an admin here. And the reason why we do this is so that we can account for what users are doing within the software, whether it's bringing in geometry, creating nests, um, or managing inventory, materials, things like that. We know what uh, each user is doing so we can understand uh, from a uh, tracking basis what, what's going on in the system as well. Once I log in here as an admin, it's going to also log me into a particular workflow or set of tools that I'm able to use. So as an admin, I can log into any of these different groups. And this is going to set kind of my permissions or my workflow um, within the software itself. So I'll go ahead and log into that admin workflow. And it's going to bring up the software. And up top, we have the ribbon, which has a tailored workflow for my administrative tasks some of the, the more um, used options within the software. And then on the left side here, I have the tree, which is um, all the features and functions within TrueNest as well. I can actually switch between groups. So if I wanted to see what the engineering by default has available to it, I can kind of switch that over. And now it's a more tailored workflow for um, just a default engineer within the software. So bringing in materials, managing material databases between design and manufacturing, managing part constraints, grain constraints, things like that. Um, and downstream for the shop floor, their workflow is the rest of the process, which is creating orders for uh, production, scheduling those orders, creating those nests, manipulating parameters on the nests, generating that NC code, and then eventually sending it down to the machine tool. So you can kind of customize these workflows uh, and add workflows as you have different potential users and, and uh, use cases in your own production scenario. So I'll switch back over to an admin. So the first thing that we need to do with TrueNest is we need to bring in geometry. So on the left here in the tree, uh, I have that first step here, that's my part import. So there's really three main steps in a basic workflow that I'm gonna be taking you through today. That's bringing in geometry, creating our orders, and then creating our nests. So we'll start with this part import process. So there's a couple different ways, as you can see, to bring parts into the system. Uh, the first way is through parametric design. So by default, we have a couple different parametric shapes available within the software um, that we can access. So if I wanted to create some rectangles or circles or things like that on the fly, I can certainly do that with some, just some input parameters um, within TrueNest. If most of my designs are already created or already drawn, I can bring them using, in using some of the other options here. So the first option that I have here is Translate. So Translate allows me to select a list of files, and what it does is it, it um, is a one-to-one -one representation of the geometry file to a TrueNest geometry file. So what we do is we interrogate the source data and we create our own internal uh, geometry file that we store uh, manufacturing information inside of that file. So we're looking for um, tooling information, things like that for the particular processes that are currently loaded into your environment. We sort of store them with the part file so that downstream we already know how to manufacture that part um, after it's nested. With an automatic process, we go after geometry as well as any metadata within that file. So this is what we're going to be using for inventor native data um, because it as we go after assemblies, we have access to information like the bill of materials, which has material quantities um, and some other properties uh, about that particular assembly. And we can bring all that information at the same time and start to fill out some of the part requirements automatically um, before we get to the nesting process. And then the last one here that we're going to go um, going to be using today is our vault integration. So our vault integration does the same as that automatic process that I mentioned before, but it goes one step further um, 
and it saves the time for the user to have to um, kind of go through their computer and find the files and assemblies that they need to bring into the system. What this does, I can give it a list of assemblies and it'll actually go into Vault and um, essentially do a get command and bring those locally to my machine. TrueNest will interrogate those files for what it needs to and then it will remove those from that client computer, um, all while not changing any revisions or versions or anything from Vault. So uh, the assembly that I'm interested in for this demo is called Punch Route. So I'll go ahead and use this option. It's going to ask me to log into my Vault. I'll go ahead and give it my credentials. And it's going through a search process. So it's looking at that assembly and it's bringing any files that are associated with that assembly to my machine. It's going to give me a status. So if there was any problems that happened with that download, if certain parts were in a certain revision, um, or if they weren't released to manufacturing, things like that, it's going to show me here and show me that they're not available um, for me yet downstream. After that process, it's going to do this translation process that I talked about. It's going to go into that assembly and find all the uh, relevant files that I'm looking for inside of that assembly and translate them into individual TrueNest uh, files. All the while, it's maintaining material information, bill material information, uh, part thickness while we do this process. Any issues with that process, um, say in this case, I'm getting a warning saying that some of my shapes are actually too small for the tooling that I have associated to the machine. Uh, so it's giving me these design uh, constraints at the time that I bring the geometry in so that I can go and, and potentially fix these things upstream in the design rather than having errors uh, as I go try to run that on my machine or if I try to post that and I get uh, some issues with uh, the post process or things like that. So it's trying to give you these warnings up front so you can deal with them before you go and um, go all the way through the workflow. So I'll just say OK to those warnings. And you can see some of the parts that I bring in here. Um, this is the assembly information. This is the part information, material and thickness. So this is the metadata that I was talking about that, that we were interested in. So as I go through these files, you'll notice um, these parts are colorized based on the tooling that's being applied here. So in this case, we're bringing it in for a router. So we can actually investigate some of the information about the layers, color, and style. So these drill holes essentially are colorized to that specific drill in the tooling library. So we already know that that uh, information, that circle on that part is a drill hole since it matched up to something in our library. We already know how to process that. And that manufacturing information is carried through downstream to nesting and to post-processing for the machine. So we can kind of look through and investigate some of these parts, make sure there's no open contours, things like that, things that will um, need to be fixed and it seems to all look good. So I've translated in my assembly. If I wanted to, I can go into what's called the part assembly review and start to modify some things about that assembly. So if I go in, I can kind of filter and see all the metadata that was brought in from that assembly. So now I see a couple different things. Um, there's a quantity of five of each of these two parts that was brought in, a quantity of 20 of this particular part that was brought in. Um, the grain constraints were already applied to these, these parts as well. But as I look through some of these parts, um, some of these parts are really nice for the punching process, like this one. I'd rather punch this part than route it, uh, since it's got a lot of different holes and I don't want to necessarily make all those drill cycles. Um, so what I can actually do is I can flag TrueNest and say, hey, I only want to process that 
on a particular machine. Similarly with this one. Uh, this one, these internal shapes, I really don't have specific punch tools in order to punch those. So I'd rather route those and then uh, drill out the holes there. So I can actually flag this for a specific machine group. And what that will do is when I schedule it, it will only be available for that particular machine. So we'll go ahead and flag that one. And I believe there's one more as well that I wanna flag this one as well. This one's not really uh, optimal for punching since it is a large contour. I'd have to kind of nibble all that out, which would take a lot of time. So I'll go ahead and flag that for routing as well. So I can do these things in the part assembly. Most of the metadata was already assigned for me. Um, but I can make these small tweaks as well if I need to. So the next step is our order entry step. And at this point, it's giving me a snapshot of all the parts that are in the system. I don't necessarily want to order everything that's in the system. I only want to order that particular assembly. So what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and filter this. So I can start typing my assembly name in. This will kind of help me autofill um, to the rest of the assembly name. And now I've got only a list of the parts that I want to, um, to use on this nest. I can give it this order a particular quantity if I want one or two, however many I want of this particular um, nest. I can give this a due date. So do I want it done by today, tomorrow, or next week? I can also give this a priority. So this will influence the position of this particular order or even a part. Um, it'll influence the position of that part on the nest. So if, if I need to add something that I really need right away, I can give it a higher priority and that will influence it to be to the front of the nest. I can also give this uh, a job order. And this will help me kind of maintain some of that information for that order downstream as well. If I wanted to manually sync to ERP or something like that, I can give this a job order. Trueness can also kind of order per facility. So if I had multiple sites or something like that, I can maintain all the information within the same environment, within the same database that Truenest runs off of, and then uh, just kind of tag that appropriately to which facility that I'm uh, interested in, as well as giving this a comment. So I'll go ahead and add that order, and I'll put that information down below. And if I wanted to, I can add another assembly, whatever I wanted to, and just gather up this large queue of parts um, in order to make sure I drive efficiency on like materials throughout my process. I can also do this process um, automatically. So I can drive the same process from an ERP or an MRP system through direct database integration or through exports like uh, export imports um, from CSVs or, or Excel files, things like that. So I'll come over to schedule orders and we've got our two different machines here. We've got all of the, the single job that we ordered the due dates, things like that, uh, the amount of unique parts, the amount of total pieces um, for this particular order. And you'll notice that there's 12 unique parts for the punch and there's 14 unique parts for the router. So because I made that change back in our part assembly to flag those two individual parts to only be run on the router, they're not even an option for the punch machine. So it helps me downstream make sure that every time I order that particular part, I know it's only going to be run on a particular machine. Additionally, I have some other dates here for cut and filler. These help me maintain when I want this particular nest to be cut by, as well as what date that I want to continue to add filler parts um, to. So a filler part is something that you keep stock of um, and potentially produce a lot to where if we add it into the nest to gain efficiency, um, it's not going to um, be a burden to keep some stock of those uh, in your shop. So we can add those filler parts automatically to drive 
up efficiency of your plates, but it's not going to add any more plates um, than what your original order would have been anyway. So we do track everything by status. So notice the status is currently active, which means I need to schedule them in order to nest them. So down here, um, we have some different statuses and I'll, I'll get into those into a second. Um, and the last thing here that I wanna to touch on is the hours and the plates. We do give an estimation based on the machine properties, um, cut speed, uh, rapid speed, things like that for the amount of time that it's going to take um, to process these parts as well as the amount of material that it's going to take to process these parts. Um, so it gives you a, an estimation there so it helps you better plan for your uh, capacity within the shop. So down here is a snapshot of everything that's currently in the system. So we have a lot of different orders that are currently in the system for uh, the, the punch and the router with, again, all these different est estimations on the hours and the amount of material that are currently being used for those nests. So this allows us to give, um, kind of see a snapshot of how much time is currently queued up for a particular machine. Would it be better to run this on one machine versus another? Um, we can kind of make those decisions before we schedule it uh, to better improve our throughput. So go ahead and actually select both of these. So I wanna run the same parts on both these machines and kind of see um, which results that I wanna run downstream. So I'll go ahead and do that and go ahead and hit schedule. So I brought my geometry in, I've created my order, and now I'm going ahead and creating my nest. So I've got that group that I just scheduled here. Um, it's also in my table down below in this scheduled status waiting for me to be nested. So I'll go ahead into the create nest and I'll, I'll run the, uh, go ahead and run the router first. So I'll run the router um, and it'll go through and what it's doing now when I click that button is it's going through and it's nesting these parts on the available plates um, that I have. So you can see the different inventory sizes come up here um, during nesting. And after the nesting is run, it's going to go ahead and create a report to, as well as run these optimizers for the specific cutting process. So in this case, we're running our automatic tabbing and our sheet cut for the router as well as the post processor. And what these are doing is it's automatically placing tabs onto the part um, so that these parts don't move or um, potentially cause issues on the nest. So go ahead and open that up. So all these little white dots that you see are the tabs on the part, and those are holding it to the sheet. The lines that you see uh, in the background are actually the sheet cut optimizer. And what they do is it breaks up the sheet into smaller pieces uh, to allow for easier removal of the skeleton after cutting is done. And what's special about the routing process, typically with routing machines, uh, the material is held to the bed via some sort of vacuum process. And the more parts that I cut out of that material, the less vacuum that's going to be there and parts could potentially move. So that's why we want to tab them to the skeleton in order to make sure that they're not uh, flying around or uh, potentially causing safety issues. But in this case, what we're doing for these tabs is, is a special process called a skin tab. So a skin tab is something that leaves like an onion skin thickness. Um, so we process through most of the thickness of the material, except for that minor onion skin in this case. And what that does is it never fully um, removes that particular tab uh, from that part. And it, and it maintains that vacuum pressure better for that particular sheet. Um, so that's something that we do special for the routing process. So we can kind of look through our different nests. 
in the different parts here. And as well, if we have any um, material that's left over, what happens is we create a specific remnant code for that. And depending on your process, we can either save that remnant for you and put it back in the inventory, and we'll use that remnant the next time that we go through the nest, uh, nesting process on that particular material. So we'll go ahead and reuse your remnants. We'll automatically process that remnant um, for you with that sheet cutting optimizer. So you can kind of see that there. It's highlighting on the edge of that remnant. So you get a clean cut that you can store back and use later for other nests as well. So let's go and run the punch process now. So we're gonna go do through, through the same thing. It's gonna go through, it's gonna create an S for those parts. But this time it's gonna run some different optimizations for the cutting process that, that we have now. So in this, uh, in, for uh, punching, we still run uh, tabbing and sheet cut because those are um, vital to the punching process as well. But you can see here it's running a nibbling process. So what this is doing is it's running an automatic tooling routine for both the internal and external contours on every part. And it's processing this based on the tool library that's currently set up in the system. So it's going to go through, it's going to um, punch out each part on that sheet um, based on your current set of tools. So whatever ob rounds, rounds, rectangles, squares, special tools um, that you have in the library, we'll try to optimally use those on the parts that we've currently nested. So this allows you to uh, essentially not have to tool all these yourself. Um, it'll go through and do the tooling process uh, automatically for you. So it's just doing the last plate here. And it's running the post processor. We're getting some warnings about our turret setup. So we're managing both the, um, the turrets in each case for the router as well as the punch press and making sure that we have the appropriate tooling available um, loaded in the machine to be able to process these nests. So if there's any station changes, things like that, um, that need to happen, the post will warn you um, and make sure that you are running with the appropriate turret settings uh, for, the, for the nesting. So we can see here all the automatic tooling that's being done for these parts. We can kind of zoom in here. So we have all of our tabs again. We have um, some of the, the circles and rectangles. Um, we have our um, trapezoid tools for our parting tool. For some of the tabbing, this leaves um, a thinner tab um, or a thicker tab um, on the part so it has more sheet integrity as we're processing the sheet. You can see the sheet cut is being processed as well with that tool. Um, so everything's been punched out. We can see some of the destruct cycles that are going on within a part internally. So if we can't hit uh, out an internal part with one single hit, we'll go ahead and automatically destruct that. We can kind of see some of the different results here as well. For the different parts. So we've automatically tooled these three plates here as well. So once we're done um, processing the nests, we have a lot of information available to us um, about this particular nest. We have a HTML report that we can take a look at and view, and this will give us um, a snapshot of everything that happened on that nest, what our efficiencies are, what settings we used for our plates and materials, all those different things. Um, so it'll go ahead and give you all your nesting parameters, what your kerf was set on the machine, um, what your 
cut speed and rapid speed settings were, what your separation of parts are, um, what your efficiency goals were for this particular machine and material. You have all the different part previews and all the different grain constraints uh, that were used, the different quantities that were used for these parts, the inventories that were tried. So you have all that information inside of the report. And then per plate, there's also a different report. And this gives you a list of all the different tools that were used to process the nest. So you can see the total hit count, the description, what stations they were, any different tooling changes that might need to happen are gonna be flagged here. So you can see T01 was used a couple different times in this. Uh, so it's telling you that essentially you would need to either open up another station um, for that particular tool, or if, if there was no other open stations available, uh, tool change would be required. You can also look at the NC code that was created. So here you can kind of comb through and search for whatever you want to do. If you're, if you're looking for a specific G or M code, you can look for those and kind of search those out and it will go through and highlight all those for you. And we can do the same for the router nests as well. So again, the turret report will look a little bit different. We'll have different tools and different stations, but essentially the same information, um, size, offsets, things like that for the tools, as well as um, how many different contours that tool was, was used on. And again, NC code for that as well. It was all created from that create nest option. And then to round out our process, we go into manage nests. And here I have some more functionality um, to be able to push this to the next uh, stage in the life cycle. So we can see here some of the status is now either staged or rejected based on my efficiency goal. So we can see the, the nesting efficiencies here um, for each plate. And based on those, I either get a staged or rejected status based on my efficiency goal for that material. If something like 26%, this was the plate with only a couple parts on it, which had the remnant. Um, if I didn't want to create that remnant, I can do things like push this back to that scheduling process to wait for more parts of the same material and add that um, add those parts together to to uh, gain more efficiency downstream. Um, if I wasn't in a rush for these parts or something like that, I can certainly do that. I can do things like repost if I needed to, if I made any particular changes or modified some position or something like that. I can repost to make sure my NC code is up to date. I can also do a backplot. So a backplot will show you a reinterpretation of the NC code, whether it's the punch or the route process. We'll kind of take a look at both of those. So this is exactly what the NC code is doing. So now we're not necessarily looking at the nest, but you can see all the different tools that are being used inside of that back flat. So we're going to see um, all the different sheet cuts, the tabs, all that stuff, and the positions of those tools. And now we can check out things like um, punching sequence, order, things like that, tool priority, um, and make sure all those settings are correct for what we want to send down to the machine. So we take a look at one of the ones for the router as well. And you can see here you have all your different drill cycles. And again, you can check out things like sequence, um, what's going to be cut first, which internals, which shapes, all that kind of stuff. You can see the different lead-ins and lead-out positions on some of the shapes. So you can see some of the tabbing that's done there, the different lead positions. Here's some of your sheet cuts that are being processed. So we can check out all that information as well. If everything looks good, we can select those plates and we can push those on to the next process. So what this does is it compiles all of those particular 
um, pieces of NC code and it sends them to either a particular folder or drive um, to where the operator can then reach those. It also changed the status uh, to sent. It updates any of your remnants, sends them back, back to inventory all in that one action. Once you have feedback from the shop that that material has been cut, those NC uh, files have been run, you can update this status to cut. And internally, what that's going to do to TrueNest is it's going to um, put that particular nest or order um, on a timer. And we can automatically purge those plates uh, and parts from, from your orders to kind of keep the, the database or, or the amount of orders that you have in the system kind of more clean, more agile. So we're not uh, storing things from, you know, five or six years ago. However long you want to store things, you can set that setting. Um, but if you want to use this status, it is there um, so that it will automatically purge these things and kind of keep your environment uh, lean and, and running fast. So additionally, you can create things like a DXF or a PDF of the nest. Um, you can do a print or plot of the nest as well. If you wanted those for your shop travel travelers, things like that. There's a couple other things that I wanted to show. So we'll go ahead and bring those up. And then after I show those, I think we'll open it up for questions. So we did a test. Um, there's a couple different options, especially for the punching that are pretty interesting. So we're doing a, a test between regular nesting versus what we call limited common line nesting versus full common line nesting. So a common line situation is where we're sharing part edges, things like that, um, in order to be able to be more efficient on the machine and not have to cut as much around each shape. So in the example that you see here, um, I took some of the parts that we just nested uh, that kind of are the same length and, and really give us a nice common line scenario. I nested them in a regular uh, orientation so you could see a, a normal separation between each part, normal tabbing, uh, normal sheet cutting, all the different stuff there. So um, in this case, we are um, processing and punching the material in, it, in its kind of in its maximum. Uh, this is the maximum amount of punches that we're going to see from these particular parts. Uh, if we do something like a limited common line, what it's going to do is it's going to kind of match some parts up that have uh, similar geometric properties. So in these cases, you can see nesting actually flipped some of these parts and put them back to back. And then we're actually doing a share cut um, between those parts. And what this does is it it's not a full common line solution. Um, full common line solutions can be tricky depending on the part mix that you have. So if you have a lot of rectangular parts, full common line is actually very useful. Um, but if you have a mix of parts that, you know, some are more contoured or, or don't necessarily line up with some of the other parts. A limited common line solution will cherry pick the parts that it feels um, go well together and will start to leverage common line between those two parts. Um, and what that does is it kind of limits the amount of uh, voids or um, areas between the parts where you have to destruct them now. Um, and it ultimately makes for a safer solution that doesn't necessarily need to be monitored as much as a full common line solution. So in this case, this would be an area um, because we uh, merge these two parts together that we need to fully destruct and make sure it's fully destructed so we don't get any floating pieces or material um, in those parts. 
So in this case, just from that, we, we actually save about um, 6% on the amount of hits for these parts, just from a limited common line scenario. So in this case, it's, it's probably about 30, 40 hits on the machine just by doing this process. And then a full common line situation. You can see now all the parts are um, full common line in between them. Again, we run into the, these situations where we need to make sure that we destruct the material between the parts um, in order to make sure that the sheet is processed accordingly. Um, but in this case, we're going to save the most amount of punches since every line between these parts is shared. Uh, you can see the difference in material utilization as well. We're using less of the material um, up top here, so we could potentially fit, um, you know, one or two more parts as well on the sheet. And we're saving uh, close to 10% now from the original nest, um, about 65, 70 hits uh, in this particular case. So um, all those savings add up over time, over nests, and uh, really contribute to an ROI, things like that, for uh, automated solutions like TrueNest. So I wanted to show that off. Um, so Rob, I'm sure there are questions. So why don't we kind of take a look at those and uh, see if people have some questions we can answer. I'd like to say that there are questions, but I think you did a great job uh, because nobody has any questions. <laughs> Good. So, awesome. But uh, yeah, if there's anybody that has any questions, either raise your hand or just go ahead and type it into the uh, questions box. If you guys do have questions uh, that you don't wish to ask at this point, go ahead and send us an email and we'll try to send it back to you answered um, or give you a call, one or the other. But yeah, Matt, we don't, we don't have any questions at this point. Okay. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll leave it open just in case somebody's typing it out. Um, there were a couple different things that I wanted to show as, as well. So I did this on purpose. Um, and if we don't get any questions still, we'll, we'll kind of kick it off to the team. So there's a couple different things um, that I wanted to show as well. So one of the things we didn't really see on uh, some of the parts or dive into was some of the cluster punching capabilities that TrueNest has. So you can see here on a part like this, you know, I, I called this out um, when we were investigating the the part assembly is as something that I don't necessarily want to drill holes into this part with the router. Um, it would just take way too long. And with a punch, uh, especially a cluster punch, it's going to be a lot easier and a lot faster to produce this part. So what a cluster punch is, is multiple tools in a row or in a grid um, that I can potentially save hits um, as it's pattern out on a part. So you can see here the blue dots are actually the center hits for this particular cluster. And each cluster is actually um, skipping one of these. So it, it is a one by three cluster. So it's um, two inch spacing. So it's actually doing this, this punch here in the center and then it moves over one. So it actually in two hits, it gets all six of these um, particular punches at the same time. And then it goes through and it does the same thing over here. So now we've eliminated um, for every particular run, we've eliminated, um, let's see, four punches um, for each time, that, for, yeah, two punches for each time the cluster runs. So we're essentially cutting this in, you know, by 30, um, by 60% by using that cluster punch tool for time savings. Um, for parts that are kind of off-centered and, and not necessarily optimized for this tool, we can go back and single hit the ones that don't necessarily fit with that cluster as well. So um, just some, some different results. Um, and on this nest, we have both these parts actually in, in a different kind of cluster. So this one is a two by two. So it's in a grid of four. So you can kind of see the different center hits there that we're saving for this part as well. Okay, we do have a question uh, from Barry. Okay. 
Uh, with regards to sheet cutting, can you dedicate what size the cuts for sheet cutting create to keep within a weight restriction for lifting? He's got an example here. It's a uh, 7HR Pro, maybe uh, 18 inches wide, and the 11HR Pro, maybe 32 inches wide. That's a great question. Um, so let's take a look at one of the nets that we have here and take a look at some of the sheet cuts. So you'll see that these sheet cut lines here are fairly evenly spaced apart. So go ahead and just kind of measure from one to the next one. So about 47 inches between those two. So it's really dividing this plate up into three pieces. So if you have stock sheet sizes, like 120 by 60, 48 by 96, you can tell this particular optimizer to divide it um, every so often in X and every so often in Y, so that you can adhere to a particular weight. So if you know that you know 30 by 40 is a particular weight, um, and that is the maximum weight that you want to restrict, then you can set up your sheet cut to be those particular dimensions, and it's always going to be less than that. Um, because as we're removing parts, we're removing pieces of that skeleton. So you can closely monitor um, by weight how much of the skeleton that you're removing. So that's a great question. And he says, thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Yeah, no more questions right now. Okay. Um, well, I think that's all I had. Um, I do have, I'll bring this slide up again just so you guys can see it. Um, if you do have any more questions for either myself or Rob uh, at SolidCAD, here is our emails um, and our websites where you can go ahead and contact us, ask, ask us for some more information. Um, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you have. Yeah, I posted the uh, <clears throat> the third of our series, part three, uh, which will be in July, July 7th. I posted that uh, registration in the uh, chat window. So if anybody has uh, still not registered, click that one, go ahead and register. Uh, and uh, tell a friend, it always, it always works. So thank you, Matt. Thank you for your time today, guys.